For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Thus declares the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, God is not like us. We are like God, being made in God's image, but God is not like us. God's people, therefore, have long needed to use metaphor and other figurative language to try to get at God, to speak about God, to strive and comprehend God. And so we read in the pages of Scripture many, many different metaphors used to talk about God and describe God, to try to define and communicate who this God we worship is. God is our rock, our firm foundation. God is a mighty fortress. God is the Lion of Judah. God is the Good Shepherd. God is our Heavenly Father. And we could go on and on. C.S. Lewis rightly asserts that one of the glorious aspects of the gospel is that Jesus gives God a face. The incarnation makes God that much more comprehensible. It enables us humans to be able to literally throw our arms around God in human form, in the flesh, even if we still can't quite wrap our minds around God. And I would argue the reverse also holds true. Taking on our human flesh enabled God to see and experience the world from a point of view God hitherto had not experienced. And even though Jesus has now returned to heaven, the glory of the incarnation continues. It continues with us. It continues in us, the church. And that is what we learned, what we read from Ephesians chapter 1 last week. The Apostle Paul declaring to the church at Ephesus, And God has put all things under Christ's feet and has made him the head over all things for the church. The church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. But God taking on familiar form doesn't necessarily make God familiar. We still have need for metaphor, for images to help us comprehend and communicate what this gospel is all about, who this God is all about. Because even in the gospel story, there are things that are beyond us. An empty tomb. An empty tomb is a challenging concept to comprehend. A risen Christ, radically roaming free from the bonds and the chains of death, that's hard to get a handle on. So too are tongues of fire and the sound of a roaring wind that descends upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost. Today is another one of those occasions, another one of these mysteries for which we need to find metaphor and imagery to really help us understand, and not just so we can tell the story in a coherent way. Pentecost is more than telling the story of what transpired with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost is about us giving ourselves over to that story of embracing our identity, our calling as the church, as Paul defines the church, the body of Christ, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. We could run with a royal metaphor, given the excitement of this weekend surrounding all the events at Windsor Castle. And if we went in that direction, we would be on solid biblical footing. 
The Apostle Peter declares that we in the church should understand ourselves as a, ho- as a holy nation, a royal priesthood of believers. In Christ, we are co-heirs to the heavenly kingdom with Christ, and that makes us all princes and princesses. So, we could have had our own royal celebration today. I know a couple of folks who would have been more than happy to have wrangled a horse-drawn carriage for us. We could have turned the meeting place into a royal tea. We could have worn fancy hats. And you already know you're going to hear a sermon about love. I hope you've come to expect that by now. (laughs) It's pretty much what I always come around to. And I always come around to it because it's what Jesus always came around to. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. That is the greatest and first commandment, Jesus said. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, Jesus declares, hang all the law and all the prophets. Running with a royal metaphor would also have given us a context to talk about protocols and expectations. When you're a royal, there are certain things you're expected to do and certain things you're expected not to do. Duty comes with the privilege. But we'd have to be careful on that note because heaven's kingdom adheres to a code of grace, not chivalry, not works of any kind. So it's a metaphor that ultimately breaks down when yoked too closely with an earthly model. The Lord's ways, heaven's ways, are not our ways. Plus, today is about how the church becomes the church, not simply that the church is the church. Pentecost is a story of birth, of transformation, a church born and shaped by fire fanned from God's holy breath. And really, the British royal family is more about ice than fire. So we really need another different image, a different metaphor for today. And there's an insert inside your bulletin showing the image that I would like to suggest. It's really a variation on a biblical theme. The Hebrew scriptures speak of God as the potter and of God's people as the clay. I'm suggesting that on Pentecost, to understand what this observance, what this event is all about, that we visualize God as a glass blower, and the church, the body of Christ, you and me, we are the glass. We had a chance to witness glass blowers at work not that long ago, just a couple of months before we made the move here to Toronto. Kristen and I took the girls to see Jamestown in Virginia, the site of the first permanent English settlement in North America. Producing glass was part of the Virginia Company's original business plan, and glass artisans actually made the voyage over to Jamestown with the goal of establishing a glassworks to help support the colony colony financially and to, of course, help turn a profit for the investors in the colony. The historical record shows that the glassworks aspect of the venture never really became successful. But archaeologists in Jamestown have uncovered the furnaces that date all the way back to 1608. And the National Park Service in the States has set up a glassworking interpretive center on that site where you can watch traditional glassworkers blow glass in the form of wine bottles and pitchers and vases and candle holders that they then sell to you in the gift shop to once again help financially support Jamestown. But for me, watching the glass blowers do their thing was one of the most memorable parts of that visit. I found the process truly mesmerizing to see them take these globs of molten glass and stick them on the end of this long pipe and to shape them and form them and turn them into something that is both beautiful and useful is truly amazing. And I find that it's analogous to how God 
transforms the church on the day of Pentecost and how the Holy Spirit continues to be at work in the church, on the church, through the church, how the Holy Spirit continues to expand and shape the church. And so there's three lessons that I want to pull from this image, this metaphor of God as glass blower. The first is that this image, like the Pentecost story, like the gospel story, it builds on history and tradition. Glass blowing is an art form that is almost 2,000 years old. It has its historic beginnings in biblical times. And much of what modern glass blowers do is still based on those first practices. But they've taken those practices, they've taken that knowledge and continue to expand it and develop it. And what modern glass artisans can create is truly mind-blowing. I know some of you saw the Chihuly exhibit at the ROM a couple of years ago, just as we did. Some of the slides that were featured in the in the slideshow earlier in the service, were from that exhibit. And the shapes and the colors of what Shahuli is able to create out of glass are just truly wondrous to behold. But it's all based on these same basic, basic techniques that have been handed down for 2,000 years or so when glass blowing first began. And that's likewise how the Holy Spirit builds and shapes the church on Pentecost and today, in our own Pentecost. Because this day we call Pentecost, it literally means the 50th day. And it was part of the Jewish festival of weeks, which is the second of the three major Jewish holy days. The first being Passover. And these three festivals are linked together and they date back to the earliest days of Israel. This is why, in Acts chapter 2, there are all these pilgrims in Jerusalem from all over the world speaking all of these different languages. They've come to the holy city for this holy festival. And the festival of weeks celebrates two things. First, it celebrated the harvest, the first fruits that the nation of Israel would bring to the temple as an offering of God. And in this way, this festival was a celebration that flowed out of the celebration of Passover. Passover marking the release of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt as Moses led them through the wilderness. But Moses didn't just free them. He didn't just lead them through the wilderness. He led them to the promised land. God led his people from slavery to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey where they could and they did prosper as a free people, where they could and did plant and harvest abundant crops. And these first fruits were highly emblematic of God's faithfulness to the nation of Israel, to the abundance that God flourished in their midst that they then, that they then returned a portion of to honor God, to worship God. But there's another aspect to the festival of weeks as well. Since at least the first or second century B.C., this festival and the day of Pentecost in particular, the 50th day, also came to be associated with the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. The Israelites celebrated on Pentecost the anniversary of when Moses received the tablets from God. This too is interpreted as a continuation of the blessing of Passover. Passover freed the Israelites from their physical bondage in Egypt. The law, the rabbis say, the giving of the law freed Israel from its spiritual bondage. So this celebration of physical and spiritual freedom, this celebration of God's abundant provision for God's people, this is the backdrop against which the events of Acts 2 play out. The Holy Spirit descends with fire upon the disciples gathered in the upper room in the midst of this festival. And in so doing, 
takes this foundation and builds on it and pushes it further than it had ever been pushed before. Peter, you will remember, quotes the prophet Joel to those who think the disciples are drunk. In those days, the prophet had long ago declared, in those days, my spirit shall be poured out on all flesh. Those days, Peter declares, are now. That time has come. This is what you are witnessing. God is, as God promised, continuing to break the bonds, continuing to lead God's people forward toward freedom. Traditional understandings are still there, but they're also being built upon. They're also being transformed. They're also being expanded. Boundaries are being crossed. Envelopes are being pushed because, as the prophet declared, God's Spirit is being poured out on all flesh. Sons and daughters shall prophesy. Young men shall see visions, and old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, God declares, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they will prophesy. And so, we, just like the Israelites before us, we stand on the shoulders of, this, of these traditions, but we don't stand here in a static way. We stand here on these foundations, and with the Holy Spirit, we continue to co-build and co-found with God what God is building and doing in the world. God has announced God's intention to continue pushing those boundaries and continue to push us deeper and further. That is the Holy Spirit's intent. In the roaring wind of the Spirit, we should come to expect the unexpected, Because our God is a God who is living and not dead. Our God is a God who does new things. Our God is a God who delights in renewal and in rebirth and in the breaking of bonds, both physical and spiritual. Secondly, Acts 2 tells us that the church is forged in the fire of the Holy Spirit through the outpouring of God's breath upon us. God blowing God's breath through us, shaping us spiritually in very much the same way that a wine bottle or a pitcher or a vase is shaped physically by the glass blower. We are formed by hands that are not our own, by a breath that is not our own. It is truly the only way that we can take shape, at least Take a shape that is both beautiful by the standards of heaven and useful according to the ways of heaven. Acts 2 is the story of how God, through the Holy Spirit, gets a hold of the church, just like a glass blower gets a hold of that molten glass and bestows upon it form and beauty that can scarcely be fathomed when the glass blower first sets to work something so much more than what it looks like when it first comes out of the furnace. Remember who it is giving this speech at Pentecost. Peter, the same guy who sunk in the lake when he tried to stand with Jesus on the water. The same guy who rebuked Jesus for talking nonsense when he began to teach about death and resurrection. The same guy whom Jesus called Satan to his face. The same guy who denied Jesus three times before the rooster crowed. The transcript of Peter's student record from Jesus' school isn't exactly what we would call exceptional. And yet... This same guy, this same guy whom Jesus called Satan is the same guy that Jesus also dubbed Peter, the rock on which I will build my church. And when the fire and the breath of the Holy Spirit is applied, that is the Peter that emerges, the Peter that Jesus saw 
when he was still unreformed and unrefined. Therefore, a central concern of our spiritual growth and development must remain learning how to allow God to take hold of us and shape us and sculpt us. Because the gospel declares that God still takes unrefined, bumbling, selfish, worldly, sinful people like Peter, people like you, people like me, and through the holy fire and holy breath of the Holy Spirit, forms us, you and me, forms us into Christ's church, the very body of Christ. Thirdly, thinking of the church as glass shaped and sculpted by the Holy Spirit reminds us that we are fragile, but we are also full of hope and potential. Things made of glass aren't intended to last forever. Glass breaks. We are created for beauty and service, but we have a shelf life. And that's okay. Because Jesus is the rock. Jesus is the fortress. Jesus is the firm foundation. And so I think adopting this image for understanding Pentecost, this image of glass blowing, helps us keep a needed and proper perspective It's not all up to us, thank God. It all doesn't depend on us, thank God. That's not what the church is made for. It's not how it's made. We, you and me, as the church, we are made to be vessels of love and grace. That is our purpose. That is our beauty. That is what we are formed and shaped for, and that is what we are called to do what we are called to be, to be bearers of this gospel love and grace, no matter what life or the world throws at us. We don't have to worry about trying to hold the center. Christ has that because Christ is the alpha and the omega. He is the first and the last. He has got this and he has got us. We simply have to focus on what we are called and formed and shaped to be. And that, my brothers and sisters, is grounds for hope. Because glass is malleable. It's one of the original recyclable and repairable materials. In skillful hands, cracks and chips can be mended, and if need be, The whole thing can be melted down and reformed completely, but it's still the same stuff, just in different form. And that is how God works on us to make us into what we've truly been created to be if we will let God get a hold of us. And so, my brothers and sisters, this afternoon as we leave this place and as we return to an uncertain and unpredictable world, a world where princes and paupers are distinctly marked, a world where excess and scarcity are systemic and are systemically reinforced. As we move forward from this holy day of Pentecost, as leadership teams here within our church prepare to transition, as we begin to discern together how God is going to lead us, to co-author the next chapter of our history together as Kingsway Baptist Church. Let us remember we are called to be vessels of God's love and grace, that we are glass in God's skillful hands, that we are extensions of the incarnation, the body of Christ, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Let us remember that God can do wondrous things with us if we will allow God to do so. We are molten glass in the fires of the Holy Spirit. We are molten glass in the hands of a gracious, loving, creative, ingenious, boundary-pushing, genre-redefining God. And so truly, we are only limited by what our timid and restrictive thoughts about what shape we think we can take, truly are. 
Let us open ourselves more fully to God's divine and holy and healing imagination and give thanks that God trusts us and calls us to be his church. Thanks be to God. Amen.